Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar presented by Zyflow. My name is Mike Peterbaugh, and I'll be one of your hosts for today's webinar on creative production benchmarks. We have just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we have uh, muted attendee lines, and that's just to cut down on background noise, but we do want questions. Uh, so please enter them at any time dur uh, via the Q&A interface in Zoom and we'll take them at the end of today's presentation. And lastly, yes, our session today is being recorded and a copy will be sent out uh, right after we finish up today. With that, let's meet our hosts. As I mentioned, my name is Mike Peterbaum and I'm the CMO here at Cyflo. Uh, I'm joined today by Will Liu, our VP of Operation, um, who heads up our customer success team and strategy. For those of you who aren't familiar with Zyflow, we're the leading innovator in the online proofing space, helping agencies and brands worldwide solve their most pressing review and approval challenges. Um, if this is something you and your team are looking um, for help with, you can find more information on our website at www.zyflow.com. Okay, let's get into today's discussion. Over the last few years, we've processed over 3 million proofs, and that's across a pretty wide range of media types. And we're kind of data nerds here at Zyflow. Well, actually, we're huge data nerds. So we decided to crack open Excel and look at some raw data to come up with a picture of what those 3 million proofs look like and how online proofing impacted creative operations. So we'll be looking at version counts and what drives version counts, the benefits of taking a workflow approach to your projects. We'll also talk about workflow um, a little bit more for those of you who aren't familiar. Uh, and we'll also look at the number of stakeholders um, and how that can affect your timelines, but maybe not as severely as you might think. So let's get into it. First, we wanted to set a baseline of what types of projects that have been run through Zyflow over the last few years. Uh, we've, which we've ranked here by a raw, basically a count approach. Um, static media files, such as the good old PDF and JPEG files, uh, and video files make up over 90% of projects completed within Zyflow. Uh, web projects, both live and static captures, while not huge contributors to the overall counts, have some interesting data associated with them, which we'll cover um, a little bit later in this um, presentation. Um, well, I don't think anyone is particularly surprised that PDFs and static design files would be the most common project types. Um, but I know you have some thoughts about video coming in at a kind of, kind of a, um, you know, respectable second place. Yeah, um, I think one of the really interesting things to me and uh, is actually the just number of different video types that we're seeing. Um, traditionally, video is always going to be dominated by the standards H.263, H.264, but what we're actually seeing as we dive into the video number is just the number of different codecs that are that our videos are getting proofed in nowadays compared to just having everything as H.264 wrapped in MP4. I think what that's really pointing to is this explosion of different video types or different video codecs is really pointing to how there are just so many more marketing channels today than there were even a couple of years ago. So now video content is coming out. Video content needs to be produced for a number of different channels with a number of different standards and optimization. So we're really seeing that explosion on just the different video types that are getting proofed through the system. Yeah, and I think uh, the other thing I always think about when I look at like video and even audio coming in at number six, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is you know often our customers are using Cyflow, so like an abstraction layer. Um, it's very easy for them to upload, you know, as we'll mention, literally the hundred different types of codecs required. Uh, to render uh, and share video files. Um, Zyflow effectively becomes an abstraction layer for that, allowing you to share out hundreds, um, over a thousand um, video types, um, in fact, uh, with team members pretty easily. Um, so I think that definitely is something that uh, is kind of an, an added value point for maybe not just Zyflow itself, but you know, really uh, an online proofing system that has that capability to manage and provide and support that many codecs. So um, now that we've set that kind of baseline, let's look at some benchmarks that start to set the tone for output. 
And the first version or the first benchmark, I should say, that we're going to look at is versions to completion. Um, creative projects reviewed in Zyflow require an average of 2.18 versions to completion. And this number blew me away actually for a couple of reasons uh, when Will first shared it as part of the research output. Um, I'd say mainly because we use Zyflow all day, every day, internally here at Zyflow. Uh, we use it so much, um, obviously, we actually did a webinar on how Zyflow uses Zyflow. Um, and most of our projects, I can tell you within the marketing department anyway, go far beyond two versions. So to see the overall average slightly above two really surprised and quite frankly, it impressed me, I guess is the best way of putting it. And I think this is even more impressive to me when I consider you know, the kind of the polling and surveying we do of our customers during onboarding is that our customers tell us that, you know, before deploying Zyflow, they've typically required between four and six versions for their projects. And that's kind of an aggregate. And that's, I would say I'd probably chalk that up to an anecdotal number. Um, but I also think that's a, just a really, really impressive number. Um, and like I said, one that was kind of surprising. Um, let's actually jump into and look at the raw data. So this is the raw view of um, the version data um, uh, across all the different, um, well, really for all 3 million proofs in our system. Um, both web forms, static and live web captures um, require more than average version counts, which I also found interesting. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about web capture a bit more in our next benchmark. And uh, we'll be coming back to this, and actually I kind of expand on this slide a little bit later to show uh, even more data and context. Um, but um, I think it's an interesting format when it comes to benchmark data, um, the, um, the web formats, both live uh, and static. Um, I mentioned before that version count was probably my biggest surprise I uh, discovered during this research. And I wanna share a few reasons why we think this is the case within Zyflow. So, and really, you know, I say within Zyflow, but you know, really I'm talking about online proofing too, really as a category. Um, First and foremost, you know, so how does online proofing help reduce version counts? And first and foremost, I point to precision feedback. The ability to mark up a creative asset, regardless of the format, um, and on the asset itself, provide that feedback. And this is where you start to avoid ambiguity and it cuts down on rework significantly. Um, you know, for example, feedback that used to drive designers crazy, like move it a little bit to the left. Who's left? How far? <laughs> Make the logo a little bit bigger. Um, you know, that type of feedback is largely avoided now because reviewers can be very ultra specific and precise. And I think that has a lot of ramifications in the number of um, versions required. And we'll, we'll kind of come back to this theme and concept a little bit later as we look at the, all of the numbers kind of uh, in context together. Um, and, you know, what if, what if comments aren't that specific? Well, you know, kind of going on to the next point, I think commenting that allows for true collaboration and not just notes um, is really beneficial. So replies and threaded, threaded comments become absolutely key. Um, I think this really helps refine change requests and also allows team members um, who maybe jump in late to the process. They can be brought up to speed very quickly by looking at the comments, seeing which comments were already made, seeing which maybe suggestions were already either kind of, you know, deprioritized or maybe deferred it allows them to get brought up to speed pretty quickly and, and lastly i'd say you know kind of staying on that commenting theme i would say that um, enhanced commenting being able to label comments and mark them as done or resolved um, i think that further streamlines the process and again cuts down on the number of uh, versions required uh, will you've got a lot of experience with this and working with our customers um, and on some of our larger scale projects too is there anything here you want to add about maybe why you think uh, you know online proofing specifically has a um, you know a positive effect a net positive effect on reduced versions yeah absolutely i think i think um you touched on the major points right mike precise feedback drives action collaboration via real-time commenting and enhanced commenting I think one of the top benefits where people are really seeing that reduction in versions is also just online proofing makes it a lot clearer on when you should create a new version. As we go through the implementation process with our customers, one of the top questions that I always get is, 
when when should we make a new version? Like when should we say that we should action on this feedback and create a new version? And without an online proofing platform, without a tool like Zyflow, there's a lot of ambiguity in that. If copy has given you their feedback already, should I go ahead and make my copy changes and then send it to design? Or should design look take a look at it first and then I can make my copy and design changes together? And what we're seeing is an online proofing tool, something like Zyflow, makes it a lot clearer on when all the feedback has been captured and when you should actually create that next version. So um, I think an online proofing tool really does two things. It, one, makes the feedback better, more consistent, and more accurate, but it also provides clarity for the people that are actually doing the work, the designers, the studio teams, the production teams. It provides clarity to them on when they should actually action that feedback. So they're not creating revisions too early or they're not creating revisions incorrectly. And those are really the top things I see drive up the version count where someone may create a version based off of feedback, but not everyone on the team has had a chance to review it yet. And we see that feed into the workflow number, right, Mike? We see how workflow has sped up turnaround time as well as improved versions. I know I'm getting a little ahead of you here, so and you're going to touch on that in a bit. But I think for me, the reduced versions can really be chalked to more precise, more accurate feedback, which the commenting tools on an online proofing tool allow you to do, but it also provides much more clarity for the teams and for them to understand, okay, we've collected all the feedback we need to, and now we should action those changes. So versions aren't being created prematurely. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Will. I mean, and it, we are going to get to a, a couple of other, you know, these supporting points in just a bit. Um, one thing I wanted to do, and this might be remedial for a lot of the people on the call today, but you know, if, if this is something what, you know, that you're thinking, well, maybe this is something we should spend a little bit more time thinking about and um, you know, maybe trying to optimize within the organization. You know, I just want to go over really quickly why it's important to track version counts as far as how we see it. And this is, you know, this is really based off of conversations with our customers and them telling us the benefits that they're getting back from you know, reduced version counts. You know, if you're tracking versions, you know, pretty regularly, it really does help you identify um, um, areas for improvement within your overall process. Um, you know, if you've been on our webinars before, you've heard Will say that, you know, making important, you know, making changes, um, positive changes to your workflow and your process has compounding effects over, you know, all the projects that you're going to run in the future. And I think that's definitely one area around versions that definitely rings true. Um, so, you know, areas for improvement, this most often starts with project scopes um, and timelines being well-defined. Um, it can also determine if workloads um, and action items are dispersed accurately and clearly and probably efficiently across teams. Um, also, one of the lagging indicators that you can learn from uh, to improve in the future is to review which projects and or teams, um, sometimes they're kind of uh, locked together, projects and teams, um, depending on if you have specialization or subject matter experts, which of those projects and teams run into challenges the most often, either in implementing feedback or, you know, even before that, soliciting feedback. Um, so, you know, this is either due to incomplete review or poor internal collaboration capabilities. Um, that's a good, you know, flag to look for that you can improve upon uh, to cut down on versions. Um, you know, also, I, you know, would point out too, is in, in the agency world, I know that we have uh, quite a few members from the agency world um, um, on the call today. It's always beneficial to better understand which clients tend to provide incomplete scope um, or they're changing, you know, requirements left and right. Um, this often obviously is requiring your team to start all over again and run up version counts, but also not just version counts, but cost. Um, that's something that I think I didn't make necessarily a, a bright line distinction or a connection to, but you know, a lot of times, and maybe many of you are on the call are thinking it already, but many time when you see more versions um, one way or another, you can also associate higher costs with that as well. So that's, uh, I just wanted to kind of do that little remedial session there. Um, you know, as Will mentioned, you know, we talk with our customers a lot about versions and we get asked that question a lot. Uh, one of the offers we made in a previous webinar, and I kind of like to just extend it now that if you're interested in, you know, doing like a workshop or consultation to find out 
you know, where in your process maybe um, you could optimize based on the experience that we have, you know, we'd love to offer that too as a, as a consultation. And um, well, I'll give you ways for us um, to get in touch with us um, to take advantage of that um, later in the call. Um, there's a couple of interesting version count outliers, um, just kind of, you know, numbers that maybe kind of popped off the, off the Excel grid um, that I wanted to share. Um, interestingly enough, static web captures average the most versions and comments per project. They, they do well over three versions per um, uh, project on average, but they have 13 comments per project. Um, you know, the average maybe is actually closer to four. Um, and there's over four decisions provided per project. And so these are all kind of outliers. Um, you know, our thinking, and I would love, you know, your, you know, feedback on this, maybe in the questions and, uh, you know, when we open up the Q&A at the end of the call, um, I'd love your thinking about maybe why new website projects, um, or not necessarily new, but why website related projects uh, require a broader set of stakeholders and often require more refinement than say a display ad, for example. I guess that's my thinking is that maybe it's new website projects. Um, but I should point out that web capture is not just for websites. It's really, um, you know, we can capture static screenshots or, or screen grabs, I should say, of URLs, um, complete page URLs, but also we can do that in a live fashion as well. Um, you know, traditionally, you know, you're probably thinking about like website pages, maybe new landing pages. Um, but we have, you know, a, a large set of customers that use iFlow to proof um, HTML emails. So, you know, if your email service provider provides a preview link, much like you know, many web uh, content management systems do, you know, uh, uh, an ungated um, preview link for either landing pages or emails. Um, you can plug those into Zyflow as well. So that may be affecting the number here, but you know, I'd love your thoughts in the uh, in the comments um, as to why uh, web projects have way more uh, comments um, than average. Um, audio files on the other end of the spectrum were by far the least reviewed media type. Um, their average was basically one version, one comment, actually less than one comment on average per project. Um, I, I think this, this highlights the additional value and, and Will touched on it a little bit before. It, it, the, the additional value of an online proofing solution that has the ability to render or you know, basically communicate and share over 1200 media types in a single UI. And this is the point I made earlier. I think many of our customers use Zyflows or a really effective um, abstraction layer uh, for sharing creative content since we render practically everything under the sun. Um, and I think that point there is that you don't have to worry about your teammates having the right application to open up a particular file. Um, if you wanna share an audio file that's gonna accompany a video, or maybe it's a radio spot or a jingle, uh, you can do that pretty easily in Zyflow in addition to, you know, obviously the more traditional types of creative content. All right, let's get on and start talking about the benefits of applying a workflow approach uh, to your review and approval process. Um, first, some quick context about what we mean here at SciFlow when we talk about, um, about workflow. Uh, we've actually done a, a work a webinar on this, um, so on this subject on itself, actually. So if you're new to this concept, you should definitely check that out. Um, definitely talk to your um, Zyflow rep who will be reaching out after this webinar uh, for a link to that webinar. You can also find it on our website or actually on YouTube too, I believe. Um, but, um, you know, when we talk about workflow in the Zyflow context, you know, we're talking about the ability to set up stages, which allow you to separate review cycles for teams or specific stakeholders, and then have those stages be progressed upon by triggers. Um, which can automatically move the project to the next stage based upon some type of predefined decision criteria, such as decisions or time boundaries. Um, and then also a core component to this is automated reminders and notifications to keep the project moving. Um, and workflow in the Zyflow context anyway, can be set up on a project basis um, or on a project by project basis, um, but also that we can also um, automate that. Um, so I wanted to actually, let's just go to the next slide before I, uh, drag Will into this. <laughs> um, I wanted to just kind of show you, um, you know, workflow by the numbers. Again, this is within the projects, uh, sorry, within the, across all the projects within Zyflow. Um, so 40% of all Zyflow proof, um, proof projects utilize workflow and that's across all media types. That number, um, honestly quite surprised me as well. Um, it's, um, quite a number of uh, projects that are having workflow applied to it. I think that's a uh, function of, um, you, know, you know, complex review processes, which we support very, very well. 
Um, and also m probably, and I won't say that this is true, um, definitely a, a rule, but I would say that it probably contributes to it, is that we do have, you know, large customers that have, you know, an agency client type of relationship where they're routing um, a creative internally and externally um, based on part of their processes. Um, you know, within that number, a couple of areas jumped out at me. Uh, one is um, video. Um, so 43% of all video projects in Zyflow utilize workflow. And 56%, sorry, 56% of all live website projects in Zyflow utilize workflow. We're going to jump into those um, and get specific um, about, you know, maybe some things that are interesting about this. Um, but I wanted to also, you know, kind of, uh, actually, let's just jump into that again before, and I'll, I'll let Will take it from here. Um, but, you know, Will, one thing I want to definitely kind of talk about is, you know, when workflow makes sense um, for um, an organization. Um, you know, I covered it briefly. I mentioned that we've done a, a webinar just on, you know, uh, workflow best practices and collaboration best practices. Um, but obviously with video, there's some benefit. But, you know, if you want to talk also about, you know, when workflow makes sense for teams, uh, please feel free. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then a couple of the really interesting things that we saw as we looked at workflow and the difference that it made for video projects is that with workflow, I think the big thing to point out is there was a 35% reduction in turnaround time for videos that used an automated workflow vid versus videos that didn't use a workflow at all and just went through a basic workflow. And that came out to 26 days of time saved. Uh, what isn't highlighted in this number, a couple of really interesting things that we saw was that the differences really came out when, when the volume of work was more. As marketers, we all know that there is seasonality. There's going to be certain times of the year where there's just a lot more projects. And we saw, we saw a 50%, 70% reduction in turnaround time in really busy months, actually. So the difference between using a workflow and not using a workflow on average through the year was 35%. But there were certain months where the volume of videos were up, where the volume of videos were higher, and we were seeing that reduction of turnaround time up to 50, 60%. A couple of things that might feel counterintuitive here as we talk about how workflow can make a difference for video projects is uh, video projects utilizing workflow on average actually have a higher number of versions and a larger number of decisions being made on them. So we actually see an increase in the core metrics for video projects using workflows versus not using them. But while there are more versions and more decisions, the turnaround time is actually faster. And that's really, uh, that's really big down to when and why you should use a workflow. One of the main things, one of the main benefits that we've talked about previously in other webinars is the key benefit for a workflow is to ensure that the correct reviewers access the proof at the right time. So you're not so you're not inviting someone into the proof too early before they can see feedback without context. And what we're seeing here is that this actually allows more people to contribute to the project, but allow that proof to stay on track and turn around quicker. So while we are creating more versions, more comments and more decisions with the workflow, it's actually getting through that review cycle faster. One, it's eliminating the time where that video is waiting for someone to pick it up and add their comments because the workflow is automatically routing it. But two, it's also making sure that it's getting to your reviewers at the correct time. So they're adding appropriate comments based off of what other people have contributed. So creating that collaborative aspect. So while the core metrics are increasing, more comments, more versions, more decisions, and it may feel counterintuitive that that reduces the turnaround time, the precision that the workflow allows you in bringing in the right reviewers at the right time and staging it so that they're getting in there when they're supposed to after another group has reviewed it is actually leading to this massive reduction in turnaround time. We see this, we see this apply for static files, we saw this apply for digital work, but it really gets telling in, comp in extremely complicated projects like video projects. That's where we're seeing the workflow have the largest reduction in effort.
Yeah, I think that was probably, you know, the thing that jumped off when I was um, jumped off the page when I was creating these slides was, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't think, like you said, well, it's totally counterintuitive that with the core, the core metrics increasing, but yet the, such a dramatic um, time savings um, and, you know, being able to turn around a project so um, much more quickly, it definitely does speak to the value of workflow. Uh, we see it also for web projects. Um, so similar to video, we see an increase in a few of the core metrics. Um, this one is actually twice as many versions, but also twice the number of decisions, um, which is interesting to me. So um, this is, um, so websites, microsites, and even web application projects really can benefit from a workflow approach to the review and approval. Um, so web projects, which utilize um, workflow, actually see a 45% reduction turnaround time. And on that scale, that's an average of nine days worth. So you're almost, you know, you're basically almost getting two work weeks back of time. And, you know, the thing about, you know, getting this time back from workflow, you know, as Will likes to say, like I, I've mentioned before, you know, these kind of things compound onto each other, right? So, um, you know, this is time that you can then get back to work on the next project, to work on, you know, strategic, you know, business building projects, um, but really almost close to two weeks of work week time saved. Um, really, I mean, that's tangible cost savings um, at the end of the day. So yeah, I mean, video and, you know, again, I, I mentioned at the top or at the beginning of the call that, you know, website uh, data was kind of interesting uh, for web um, type of projects. It was really interesting. I think we have one more example where that kind of sticks out as well. Um, that we'll get to. Um, you know, there's a couple of key takeaways on workflow, and we're going to do kind of a, a larger takeaway section at the end of the presentation. But I felt that workflow was so impactful. I wanted to, I wanted to maybe just do a couple of key takeaways just on workflow. You know, more people and collaboration. And collaboration, I will kind of mold together as you know, comments and decisions. And that doesn't always mean longer project delivery timelines. So, um, you know, as we'll mention you know, making sure that the right people get the, um, the creative at the right time in the process. Um, you know, with those proper guardrails in place, stages, time and or decision-based triggers, automated um, notifications and reminders, you know, workflow can really help manage those larger team review and projects. Um, so I think that's a really important piece to kind of reiterate here. And even with two or three times the amount of versions, um, comments and stakeholders writing feedback, delivery timelines can actually be accelerated, which I think we just showed. Um, and I know this is the point I just kind of made at the end of the last slide, is that actual day saved, um, you know, they're compounded across team members, right? So it's like nine days, but how many team members did you have on um, the project? You know, is it nine times five people days? Um, you know, that's a lot of, you know, people days to get back for, you know, future work. And that's real tangible opportunity cost um, dollars right there. Not only is it hard cost, but it's also opportunity costs. Could you take on more projects? You know, could you secure a new client um, with the time saved? Possibly. Um, you know, could you take on, you know, next quarter's projects, start with them a little bit early? Sure. Possibly. Um, so for our last section, we wanted to look at, uh, you know, time is precious and um, so are timelines. And we wanted to see, um, we wanted to look at timelines and some contributors to why turnaround times are what they are. So, you know, first is a question. Uh, do more stakeholders lengthen um, projects? And I hate this answer, but it depends. Um, you know, I think what we just showed, for example, video projects, the video projects sit within averages um, for versions and comments made on those versions, but have the longest average turnaround time of 65 days. Um, that's the average, um, you know, that, that starts to contribute to that number that we'll just walk through as far as the time saved against workflow or when you utilize workflow. I, I think the video specifically, you know, this probably, this could be due to, I should say probably, uh, due to the extensive like post-production work that's required between versions, especially if you require a reshoot um, or touch-ups, which are typically done, you know, by hardcore video editors, um, there's some time required in between. So I think that is probably what contributes the most. Um, you know, and kind of going back to the web um, example, and the other way of looking at it is the media format with the most comments on average. So that'd be live website captures. And we'll look at um, the raw data in just a second. 
those projects <laughs> and that media format, live website captures, actually has the quickest turnaround time. Um, so, and I asked that question a little bit earlier is perhaps those projects have the most urgency or another way of looking at it is they might be the easiest types of projects to knock down uh, and to complete. So, you know, I, like I said, I, I, I don't necessarily think that more stakeholders or more comments um, necessarily impacts the um, um, a project turnaround time. Um, so let's look at the raw data in this case. Um, the box is shaded in blue, just to kind of orient yourself in this, uh, this, this sea of numbers, this eye chart of numbers. Um, the boxes shaded in the blue are the highs for each category. Uh, and I shaded the live web capture data that we just talked about to call that out, just as a secondary example. Um, I found it interesting that static web captures and live web captures have, have significantly different stats. I don't really have a good explanation for that myself, uh, but I'd welcome anyone's thoughts on that in the chat or Q&A. Actually, that was something that I just kind of noticed as we were about to go live here. So, uh, Will, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that off the top of your head, you know, why static or live um, are so divergent. Yeah, um, I think it actually comes down to, to the the enhancements that um, I think it comes down to the actual enhancements that live website proofing gives you. And this is one of the critical aspects. We talk about it. Um, we talk about it a lot in other webinars where as you're evaluating online proofing tools, you want to make sure that they can handle things like a live website review. Um, a lot of digital work is interactive. There's things you click, there are pop-ups, there's hovers, there's drop downs. And a static web capture really doesn't capture that for you. It doesn't allow you to see that. So where you see that is people need to ask more questions on the comments. What does this do if I click here? What should happen here? And it also, it also allows for, tying back to what we said earlier, a static web capture is great if it's a single page, like a microsite or a blog. But once you get into an actual website, then you have more richer digital elements to it. And if you can't represent that in a live website, then you start introducing more questions and less precise feedback. So that's why we always really recommend using the live website feature. And if you're using an online proofing tool without live websites, you're probably going to see that increased comment and version and turnaround count because you can't give as precise feedback. Yeah, that's a great point, Will. That's a really great point. And I think it's a uh, not to talk too much just specifically about SciFlow as a product, um, you know, in the webinar, but that is a, a big differentiator for ours um, as our clients who are, as you mentioned, Will, running, you know, large website projects that, you know, they want to check the interactivity of it, but also they want to go more than one page deep um, to maybe you know, follow maybe perhaps a product story or a narrative or the buyer journey uh, to make sure it's all of a consistent experience. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you know, I, I think the other thing, the, the one thing that I, you know, there's a bunch of things that if you look at this chart long enough, you can start to draw conclusions on. Uh, video, I, you know, we've, we've come back to video quite a bit on this webinar. Um, but, you know, you look at the comments for project and the versions for project, you know, all very well within, um, uh, within average. Uh, and then you look at, you know, decisions and turnaround time, you know, obviously I think that speaks to not only the complexity, but also, you know, the work that goes into um, video projects. Um, and then uh, there's a good old audio uh, at, the, at, the, at the end of the chart, um, barely a comment per proof or per project, I should say, and just a little bit over a version. Um, but yet still, you know, very important to those who, uh, who uh, you know, traffic in that type of um, project. Um, let's see, I believe actually now that we've tortured you with these numbers and my computer actually just froze. Oh, wow, that's what happens when you put a ton of numbers on your screen. Uh, let's see, I may, there we go. Uh, let me go, okay. So um, I wanted to, sorry about that. I wanted to look or, you know, I wanna actually turn the phone over to Will. Since we tortured you with these, um, that number chart that froze up my screen, uh, I also wanted to look at some outliers. Or we wanted to look at some outliers. Um, so we found some fun facts from our research, um, some really big numbers. So I wanted to have Will walk you through these um, before we get into our uh, kind of summary. Yeah, absolutely. So, so um, fun fact, uh, I always like to look at these and say like, okay, what's the biggest numbers we have? 
Now, some of these are crazy. Um, the highest comment count in our approved proof, so total number of comments that took to get approval was actually a little shy of 1,300. Um, that was in about six versions. So they were averaging about a little over 200 comments per version. So if you ever think that your design team or your copywriters and editors are giving you way too much feedback, there are definitely some reviews that are uh, going in there and they're getting upwards of 100, 200, 300 comments per version of the proof that they're putting out. So we see a large number of comment counts, uh, the largest one being almost 1,300 comments. The most versions we saw on our approved proof is 73. So from beginning to end, from very first version to final version before approval, it took them 73 versions. Across those 73 versions, they recorded about 700 decisions. So averaging about a little less than 10 comments per version. Now, now a couple of really interesting things here is the average turnaround time per version for this project was about four days. So um, it's still an extraordinarily quick turnaround time as they're going through the full review cycle, adding their comments, capturing those comments, submitting their decisions, getting it out to a production team to make those changes, kicking off that new version. A couple of really key things I do want to point out is we're um, all three of these, if you're wondering, were workflow projects. So all three of these definitely took advantage of the automated workflow to keep track of this high comment count, large number of versions, and big number of decisions. And where we're really seeing these large numbers is when it comes down to marketing compliance projects. As you have to get brand compliance or regulatory compliance, we're seeing the number of comments, versions, and decisions go up because you wanna make sure that you're capturing the right things. But as Mike and I talked about earlier, even though we're seeing these huge numbers on versions, decisions, and comments, counterintuitively, turnaround time is still shrinking because the workflow is allowing it to push through and stay on track and move the projects faster. So uh, uh, just, just want to touch on some of the fun facts. If you're ever complaining about your designer giving you too many comments, well, at least they're joining a really great group and getting up there on that high comment count or decision count but you can rest assured knowing that all the comments, all the decisions, everything's being logged and tracked and will be available for audit purposes in the future. Uh, as I mentioned, we are gonna make a copy of today's presentation um, available to everyone. Um, so please feel free to print out just this slide and put it up either in your office or in your cube or in your home office uh, to maybe make yourself a little bit better about when your project maybe creeps into version four, or version five. <laughs> Uh, those are some great stats, Will. Thanks uh, for sharing those. That That is always a fun part of doing this type of research is to uh, uh, sort highest to lowest in Excel and just look for the horror stories. So that's great. Uh, I think uh, that actually, yeah, that takes us toward the end of today's presentation. I want to just cover um, a few key uh, takeaways. We've got a few Q&A uh, questions in the Q&A box. Um, while I cover these takeaways, please feel free to jump into the Q&A uh, and ask your questions. Um, you know, I think at a high level, obviously not all projects are created, um, not all projects, I should say creative projects are the same, but a consistent, uh, consistent system and process for reviewing and approving those assets obviously is incredibly beneficial. Um, more reviewers, contributors, and stakeholders, that doesn't necessarily have to mean long, longer project cycles. I think we covered that pretty well on today's call, um, as workflow can help you but even without workflow, project timelines tie closely with the medium uh, and the work being done in between versions. I think that's something to consider as well as you start to chip away maybe as, a, a, as um, you know, improving on your version optimization um, as maybe a key. Um, and one thing that we kind of touched on that I do want to kind of surface before we let you go today is that the time saved via automation, stage triggers, notifications, reminders, that's, that, that is real tangible time. Um, that is real time that you get back. And I think we demonstrated a couple of, you know, extreme examples of getting time back um, and how many people days you can, you know, basically reacquire um, by leveraging both workflow, but also the automation capabilities within workflow. And now that, you know, that means just more time spent on high value, creative uh, and strategic work. 
so I'd say those are kind of our key takeaways. As I mentioned, um, you know, we're happy to share all this data. You, everyone will be getting a copy um, of today's presentation and a recording of the webinar as well. Um, at that point, um, I want to uh, go ahead and open up the q and I've got a few questions. I see just a couple of questions. Maybe that'll spur some other questions. Um, but while I am um, asked and, you know, while we address these questions, if you're interested in taking a product tour, uh, go ahead and um, go to zyflow.com slash demo uh, and we'd be happy to walk you through um, workflow examples, um, but also how we might be able to help you um, optimize your review and approval process. All right, so with that, let's go to the questions. Just a couple here I see. Let me just minimize this window. Yeah, and as Mike is pulling up the questions, one thing I do want to point out is as people look at benchmarks, they always inevitably compare themselves to it. So if you're noticing that your version count is much higher than the average that we're seeing within Zyflow, or you have way more comments, way more decisions, a much longer turnaround time, I would say, um, I would say, please feel free to reach out to the Zyflow team with over a decade of experience. We know every trick and best practice under the sun on how to get the most out of your review and approval process and make it as efficient as possible. So if you are noticing that your, your turnaround times and your version counts are much higher than the benchmarks here, don't get discouraged. Please reach out to the Zyflow team and we're more than happy to work with you to try to optimize your workflow. I think Will was cheating and saw the first question, which is, does Zyflow offer examples or best practices for workflow? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> As Will just mentioned, uh, we'd be happy to walk you through uh, industry specific. Um, Will touched on the area of compliance. Uh, that is definitely something that more and more of our clients are looking to demonstrate their control over their review and approval processes. Uh, and workflow is an awesome way to do that. So yeah, absolutely, we can offer examples. Um, uh, through that. Um, just please do get in touch with us and we'd be happy to uh, kind of talk about your situation and share with what we've learned, as Will mentioned, and over 10 years of experience in this space. Um, the, next, the second question, our last question actually is, I have a product question. Is there any limitation on who can provide comments on a project? Um, Will, I'll let you answer that one. That's a good question. I think as we talked a lot about comments and decisions, um, you know, may have aroused, um, arisen some questions about like who can actually provide those comments and questions and decisions. No, um, that's a great question. There actually is no limitation on who can provide comments and give feedback. That's what, one of the nice things of an online briefing platform like Zyflow. You actually can control for each reviewer, can they add comments, can they make decisions, can they add comments and make decisions. So um, as, as you're sending out your proofs to review, you get a lot of granular control over what each person's role is on that proof. Um, as we're talking about reviewers on a proof, I think a fun fact that um, we missed, but is definitely worth pointing out is the most reviewers on a proof. The most reviewers I've ever seen on any individual proof within Zyflow was 670. So you can have as many reviewers as you need on a proof as well. So if it's a large scale project and you need a lot of people to see and provide feedback, you can definitely throw hundreds of people for that review. And for each reviewer, you can give them their own unique permissioning. Wow, yeah, I may add that to the slide in post-production then, Will, that's an amazing number. Uh, it's an amazing number. Yeah, so that actually uh, is our only two questions. Um, I wanna thank uh, everyone who attended today. Uh, thank you for asking your questions as well. Um, if you'd like more information, you can reach us at zyflow.com. And as I mentioned before, we'll be in touch uh, a little bit later today, uh, maybe this evening um, with a copy of today's presentation. Uh, so that does it for us. Thanks, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining, everyone.